Thanks for coming back to this year's missions conference. My name is Pastor Joe Chan, and I've been a pastor with the Alliance for uh, 16 years now. And if you missed yesterday's talk, I want to invite you to take a look at those first. Uh, I spend a little bit more time talking about Albert Benjamin Simpson and his life and how he became a pastor and his initial works. Today, I want to focus more on the development of our denomination and the main vision that Simpson had for world evangelism. Yesterday, I talked about what the, the Christian Missionary Alliance foundational theology is. It's called the Fourfold Gospel and how Simpson developed that. And taking the work that Jesus Christ um, did for us on earth, being the Savior, the Sanctifier, Healer, and Coming King, Simpson developed a theology of missions that started over 100 years ago and continues to this day. As I mentioned yesterday, Simpson didn't want to start uh, a new denomination, but rather he wanted to, to, to create a, a foundation or an institute of uh, a, a Christian training centers and missionary training centers that would help the Christian understand what it was to live a Christ-like existence. And the second, the missions uh, sending organization he wanted was an interdenominational one that welcomed like-minded Christians from all denominations. He wanted to create these two alliances of Christians and of missionaries so that the gospel of Jesus Christ could be spread around, uh, around the world better. The desire for this stemmed from his work in his own church the Gospel Tabernacle in New York City. There he ministered to the immigrants, the poor, outcast people of society of the day, many of whom lived in the inner city, and unfortunately many of whom these people were ignored by the established churches and denominations. Simpson found that this was absolutely unacceptable because if a church wasn't going to reach out to them, how would they ever become saved? How would they ever receive the salvation of Jesus Christ? It didn't work for him. <clears throat> so he, he attempted to create these centers to hopefully encourage Christians to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to everybody. He wrote this as an explanation. One of the greatest dangers in the Alliance movement is to isolate ourselves from the great currents of Christian thought and life among the churches by getting into exclusive circles and trying to build up petty work which scarcely differs in its spirit from a sectarian movement. While in many cases, a local work requires to be organized and maintained as a mission or an independent church, let us always be careful to avoid the mistake of representing this as an alliance church or antagonizing other churches or pastors. God has called us in this work to an interdenominational mission and has a message through us for all his people. What he goes on to explain is that the Alliance was never meant to be a denomination where, where, where Simpson would set up another us versus them kind of mentality. For there was a time at the turn of the, of the last century where many churches, many different denominations did coexist, but in a territorial kind of way. An example of that still happens today. Uh, not too long ago, a few years ago, one of my classmates from Bible school, also a pastor, was think considering looking for work. And so I posted on this friend's uh, Facebook site, uh, Facebook page, why don't you come back to the Alliance? Winky face. I meant it in a, as, as a joke. I, I know she's really happy with her denomination, but one of their denominational leaders wrote this huge rebuttal and, and rebuke, calling me uh, disrespectful and, and, and um, divisive for trying to steal staff from another denomination. My friend understood it was a joke and came to my, my defense, and, and I really appreciate that. Um, wrote back and said, you know what, Joe would never purposely steal staff. He's just he's just joking about that. What does it matter anyways, really? We're all Team Jesus. 
and th this is the crazy this is the crazy story that that happened uh, throughout history amongst uh, between denominations it's things like this that Simpson wanted to avoid by creating an alliance rather than a denomination see the birth of our denomination came from these two organizations the first was the Christian Alliance an organization that was meant to focus on the deeper Christian life a training institute to teach people Bible theology and and scriptural truth how to apply it in their everyday lives second was a missionary and and uh, evangelical missionary training institute which focused on the idea of bringing back the king speaking about these two organizations Dr. Bernie Vanderbilt writes this in his book, The Heart of the Gospel, about the first. <clears throat> the very name Alliance gives an indication of the nature of the organizations Simpson sought to develop. He did not try to found another denomination or to steal away people from existing churches. Rather, he simply wanted to bring together Christians of whatsoever evangelical name who were longing to experience the Christian life more deeply. This fraternal union that would become the CNMA was to supplement and not replace the legitimate work of evangelical churches. He sought to found not an ecclesiastical body, but a fraternal body of believers in cordial harmony with Christians of every name. Simpson did not despise denominations, but felt that they were not meeting all of the church's needs. There's no antagonism, whatever, in the alliance to any of the evangelical churches, he insisted, but a desire to help them in every proper way and to promote the interests of Christ's kingdom in connection with every proper Christian organization and work. Simpson always conceived of the alliance as a partner and not a competitor with the denominations in fulfilling the Great Commissions. These two societies, uh, this is Dr. Van der Waal continuing to write, <clears throat> The two societies, which were afterwards merged into the Christian Missionary Alliance, were organized at Old Orchard, Maine in the summer of 1887 for the purpose of uniting Christians in fellowship and testimony in a purely fraternal alliance. The large number of consecrated Christians in the various evangelical churches who believe in the Lord Jesus as Savior, Sanctifier, Healer, and the coming Lord, and also of uniting their efforts in the special aggressive work of world evangelism. For this reason, the lead, under the leadership of Simpson, the alliances never sought to be denominations in their own right. Simpson, Simpson's own vision was not that the denominations would be left behind by the popularity and righteousness of the alliances, but that through the invigorating influence of the alliances, the ministry of the denominations themselves would flourish. Simpson describes this anticipated animating influence as the most significant feature of the work for it stimulates faith in God and earnest aggressive work for our fellow men among the other Christian organizations as well as individuals. What we can take this to mean is that Simpson established the Christian Alliance as an interdenominational organization in order to train Christians through Bible study and theological lessons. Hopefully, as a result, the denominations would be strengthened by having Christians who are better educated about the Bible, about apologetics, about theology, better Sunday school teachers, better Bible study leaders, better everything. This was his hope, that all churches would be strengthened by becoming part of this Christian alliance. As for the second organization... He wanted once again to create an interdenominational mission agency. The emphasis was on the message of bringing Jesus to the world. Again, I want to reference Dr. Van der Waal and read from his, his, his book. The second group, the Evangelical Missionary Alliance, also sought to be universal, to have Catholic and unsectarian character and spirit, and to unite Christians of all evangelical denominations Catholic as in universal not Catholic as in the Roman Catholic Church okay given its ecumenical outlook the evangelical missionary alliance also tried to draw resources and support from wherever they might suitably come 
Moreover, it sent eligible missionaries without regard for their denominational preferences. He states very clearly, Simpson states very clearly, these missionaries were not to import their own denominational prejudices and bigotries into the fields they served. The only ecclesiastical regulation that the Alliance professed to enforce were those that were in harmony with the broader evangelical truth. Simpson himself regarded denominational prejudices and hostilities as a blemish upon the church and not as required essentials for new, naive, and in innocent congregations to get caught up in. Simpson and the Alliance did not wish to compete with other missionary agencies for either workers or resources. The benefits of running a non-denominational missionary training uh, agency is that it allows for missionaries to come from any denomination. It allowed for funds to be raised and not limited to particular denominations or families of churches. Funds can be raised from all sorts of churches and families. And this was a wonderful thing. One of the benefits include the spread and the use of resources being doled out more evenly. As an example was the early days of missions to Hong Kong. In these days, around the turn of the, for the, the, the century there, around the 1900s, it was very popular for Baptists, Methodists, Presbyterians, and yes, even a little bit later, Alliance churches to send missionaries to Hong Kong. But I ask you this question, what is the purpose? What is the point of having so many different organizations working in the same city? And not only were they working in the same city, they were working competitively. Across the street from the Methodists were the Presbyterians. Why would you have a competing organization teaching the same thing about Jesus Christ, trying to compete for the same neighborhood? Simpson saw that a united organization would ensure that people, people groups, resources would be better spread out that we'd be able to reach as many people as possible and more efficiently instead of just uh, trying to steal from, from one particular group or another. See, our, our mission strategy is different from, from a lot of other agencies. We tend to send missionaries to the least reached people groups, the least likely groups of people that other denominations may not send missionaries to. That is our goal. This is what makes the Alliance stand apart from everyone else. But try as he may have, Simpson's goal of not starting a denomination just wouldn't happen. Why, you might ask? Well, there are several factors. There are several factors that we have to take into consideration. Dr. Van der Waal writes this. The CNMA could not avoid becoming a denomination. The very success of its evangelistic efforts left it with a large number of new converts whose only church homes were local alliance branches or Bible study groups. In order to care for them properly, the fledgling organization had to organize its branches into churches and eventually to recognize itself as a denomination and reorganize as such. The CNMA continues to grow today in Canada and the United States. And abroad all over the world, we now have over 16,000 individual congregations, 88 countries, 4.5 million registered members. What a wonderful con uh, denomination to be a part of. You may still ask, though, what was the driving vision behind Simpson's desire to engage in missionary work? It sounded nice to have Bible studies and to have training centers, but it all relates back to two passages. The Great Commission, found in Matthew chapter 28, 19 and 20, and Matthew 24, verse 14. Simpson's teaching revolved around these two particular slogans at the time. Every tribe and nation and bring back the king. Let's look at these one at a time. Matthew 28, 18 to 20 says this. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, 
baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. As we look at this passage, we can quickly deduce where Simpson got his reasoning for a missional push. As a call to all Christians, these are the words that Jesus Christ left to us when he ascended into heaven. He says distinctly to his disciples that you have authority, now here's your responsibility. He instructs them clearly, go make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Teach them to obey everything I have commanded. These are the things that the responsibility of all Christians have. Not just the preachers, not just missionaries, not just evangelists, not just Sunday school teachers, but for all Christians to, to obey. There are a few things I want to highlight here, though. Quite often, we, we, we see this as the missionary push, and we say, look, the first word is go. And, and we think the scriptures say, go make disciples, and we, we, we take go to be the main action of this verse. However, I would suggest differently. The main action of this sentence isn't to go, but rather to make disciples. Grammatically speaking, and if you're a grammar aficionado, um, you'll understand that there's a difference. I believe that the make disciples, the make, is the imperative command, and the other three, go, baptize, and teach, are subordinate participles. In other words, the overall command is for us to make disciples, and how we do that is by doing the other three. Very quickly, let's talk about these. The reason why go isn't the main action of this sentence is because it's not just about relocating, geographically I mean. But the word go means an affirmative action. Many people think that they can't get involved in missions and it scares them because they have to go. Maybe you'll end up in Africa, maybe you'll be torn apart uh, from your family or your comfort zone. Um, Maybe you'll have to quit your job, but that's not that's that's not the case. You're actually missing the point. The go isn't to relocate necessarily. It is to say more like, let's get this game going. Let's make this project happen. Let's start. Let's be affirmative in doing something. That's what this idea of go means. It's to start to participate in. And second, about baptizing. It's the initiatory rite of the Christian faith. When we look at baptism throughout history, it seems like, uh, particularly for our churches, the Chinese Alliance churches, the question is, when should a Christian be baptized? And while this differs from church to church, I do have to say, in our Chinese Alliance churches here in Canada, there seems to be this expectation of not being quite ready to get baptized. So a lot of people put off baptism until they're ready. But my question is, when are you ready? When you're sinless? Perhaps when you've studied the Bible enough? Well, I encourage you to remember that throughout the Bible, baptisms were always an initiatory rite. When the centurion and his, and his uh, servant boy were healed. They were they asked to be baptized at the earliest convenience. When Stephen, or no, when, when Philip met the Ethiopian eunuch and he and, and, and explained the scriptures to the eunuch, the eunuch accepted and was asked to be baptized right away. The book of Acts tells us very clearly, repent and be baptized for the for the forgiveness of your sins. See, it's an initiatory right, not a when you're ready, because you'll never be ready. Because when we say when we're ready, we really mean when we're good enough. But that kind of misses the point of baptism, of Jesus' work. The first thing that people do when they accept Jesus Christ is to receive forgiveness. Now, of course, there needs to be some sincerity and understanding of baptism. 
what it really means, what it stands for. So I would encourage you that if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior to talk to your pastors and to take the baptismal class. Make sure you know what you're, you're, you're getting into. I know that some of our churches have age limits, and we, we, we instituted these just to make sure that you're at a stage in life where you truly understand the significance of baptism. But if you're waiting for a time when you're finally good enough to get baptized, I think you're missing the point. Christ's forgiveness has already removed your sinfulness. Christ's forgiveness and salvation has already justified you and declared you righteous. So taking that step of baptism is a step of obedience. So I encourage you, if you haven't been baptized yet and you've been a Christian for a while, it's probably time that you looked into it. Now talking about teaching people to obey the commandments of Jesus Christ, well, I have to take a point, take a moment to point something out. I think I think the whole statement speaks for itself, but I do have to particularly address something. And I want to make a light rebuke. And I want to reiterate that nobody from the church said, hey, you need to talk to so-and-so about this or reference something because so-and-so in our church is saying or doing this. I, I, I just really believe that God is convicting me to say this to all Christians, even to myself. It's a general rebuke for all of us. It's very common and likely today in North America, in our 21st century, that Jesus teaches us to obey his commandments, but very often and very quickly, some of us pick and choose which commandments that we want to follow and which ones we conveniently dismiss. For example, maybe we're very, very loving with particular individuals, but we're very, hmm, a little bit too, too, too relaxed when it comes to less than loving actions towards another. Maybe we're quick to point out faults in someone else's lives, but we, we overlook them in our own. Maybe, maybe we, we have something that we struggle with and we'll be, be, be judgmental of somebody else. Sometimes Christians have a hard time obeying all of the commandments. I know I do. But the reality is, if we call ourselves a Christ follower, we need to follow Christ's example that he left for us. In every word and action, every decision that we make, we have to follow Jesus Christ in all of our ways and all ways. We have to follow Jesus Christ. If you don't understand what I'm talking about, I, I, I think, once again, I need to point you to your, your pastors. But these three participles, these three commandments, help us fulfill that make disciples instruction that we got earlier. Only by baptizing, initiating people into the church family, only by going and being affirmative with spreading the gospel, only by obeying the commandments can we really make disciples. But that's not the end of the story. The second verse I want to touch on is this one, Matthew 24, 14. Much of Simpson's work and eschatological outlook was based on this verse. The big word eschatological, what it really refers to is the return of Jesus Christ. And in particular, this verse drove Simpson's urgency to reach the nations and to come up with the slogan, Bring Back the King. This was meant to, to, to spur people on to say, you know, this is important and we need to get to it right away. You see, for Simpson, he lived in a time where humanity was on an upswing. We, he was moving, he was living in, in, in the modern society where technology, medicine, science, we're all on this incredible upswing. Innovation was, was just doubling every day. Humanity was in this place where even the church saw society as, an, as, as moving towards a perfect utopia, a perfect, peaceful world. World travel 
business, innovation, scientific discovery. These were all changing the world. And it seemed to unite the world in prosperity and advancement. And many Christians of the day saw this as the time leading up to when Jesus Christ would return. However, Simpson and several of his uh, fellow theologians of the time saw otherwise. There were generally two understandings. One where humanity would become more and more peaceful, more and more um, perfect, and then Jesus Christ would return. But other people saw that despite all of this, humanity was actually getting worse and worse. And only the return of Christ could intervene in the, in, in, in the current course of history. Simpson thought the second way. Dr. Van der Waal highlights in his book, Simpson bucked the general cultural trend and took a pessimistic view of the world's future. He was, for example, convinced that the universe was withering and not flourishing. The notion of growth of a spiritual millennium was unscriptural. The world was becoming worse and worse. Christ would not be greeted at his return by a spiritual utopia. Rather, when he comes, he will find the world and its rulers not waiting to welcome and worship but arrayed against him in the last dread battle of Armageddon. If things were to improve, Christ must come to change them. Simpson believed that Revelation 20 described the coming of the Lord as a preceding, introducing, and making possible the peace that was expected. Dr. Vanderwell continues on. Simpson's goal of evangelizing the world drawing out the elect and completing the church, all gain their impetus from this verse. And it says this, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. He interpreted this verse to mean that above everything else, the preaching of the gospel as a witness in all the world will quicken the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that the age of blessing for which the church is waiting for and the faith and the hope of God's children have to look forward to all dependent on this. The church is not to wait passively for the return of Jesus Christ, but given the casual and not merely chronological relationships between world evangelism and Christ's return, they must actively pursue it. In fact, the evangelization of the world and the consequent preparation of the bride was the Lord's own appointment, appointed way of hastening his second coming. You see, according to Simpson, the Lord's second coming depended on the completion of two different kinds of tasks. Those that the Lord himself were responsible for, which he believed were complete, and the worldwide evangelization, which was the church's responsibility. In other words, Simpson believed that the work of salvation had already been done by Jesus Christ. Authority had been given to the disciples, and along with that responsibility of making disciples was to go to all nations. And only then, when the, when the work was done, would Jesus Christ return. It's no wonder why Simpson was so, so passionate about reaching all nations. Simpson would pass away in October of 1919. During this time, the last years of his life were, were times where he watched the world plummet into incredible darkness. Remember, this was a time of World War I, where the world gathered together to fight evil. It was in this time where his hopefulness, though, actually grew. As the world plunged itself into darkness, Simpson saw a hope that the gospel of Jesus Christ was being brought all over the world by the soldiers that were um, traveling. And 101 years after Simpson's death, the Christian Missionary Alliance continues the work of this gospel to bring Jesus Christ to all of those who have yet to hear his name. As I said earlier, the Alliance is now officially in over 88 countries, with over 4.5 million members. 
we're not even counting the the churches in our in our unmentionable countries closed access nations we have over 1600 pastoral and missionary training centers across the world and this is the heritage that we have 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 inherited as the Christian and Missionary Alliance Church furthermore even just in Canada we have 440 or so churches 104 of them are Chinese Alliance churches almost a quarter of our denomination in Canada are our Chinese Alliance churches and you are a big part of that but you may still be asking what is it that I can do what is my role to play in this missionary endeavor well I'll invite you to come back tomorrow as we investigate this as we look into this because as the Christian and Missionary Alliance we can't only be focused on the salvation of our own souls part of our heritage part of our DNA part of our identity is to bring that hope of Jesus Christ's forgiveness and salvation to the rest of the world as well we must be the hands and feet because in this world the chances of people randomly picking up a Bible and reading it is very slim you may be the only exposure to Christ's love and forgiveness and hope that your family and friends may ever have so I encourage you come back tomorrow and we will discover that it is time for you to take your place let's pray father God I pray as we go from tonight you will already give us an openness in our heart speak to us as we rest and show us our place our place in your great plan to bring the gospel the hope of Jesus Christ to the world we pray this in your name amen good night see you tomorrow morning